Hello and welcome to BCM 325 Future Cultures. In this video lecture series, we are going to examine four key contributors to cyberculture, cybernetics, cyborgs, cyberspace, and the cyberpunks. Very few concepts have shaped the way we think about the future as much as cyberculture, defined as the social conditions that emerge from the use of computer networks for communication, entertainment, and business. Cyberculture is a product of the age of information. Cyberculture is the experience of satellites, computers, mobile phones, the internet, facial recognition, robots, artificial intelligence, and so on. Almost all electronic and digital and network technologies contribute to cyberculture. But it is in how we react to these technologies, how we shape their use, how we imagine their future, how we regulate their effects and develop laws and customs and habits and beliefs and otherwise incorporate these technologies into our lives that actually results in cyberculture. At times, cyberculture has been imagined as utopian, as being uniquely liberating for society and pro-democratic life and anti-capitalist and anti-corporate progressiveness. But cyberculture has just as frequently been represented as dystopian, susceptible to the influence of governments, corporations and corrupt officials at the expense of community and individual liberty and expression. All the films that we've been screening and live-tweeting about in this course demonstrate the tensions between these two competing polarities of cyberculture. And while our everyday lives tend to be more mundane and simultaneously more complex, the result is a mixed reality of cybercultural experiences. This week, in this lecture, we're going to focus on the underlying concept of cyberculture known as cybernetics. Cybernetics was defined by Norbert Weiner as the scientific study of control and communication in the animal and the machine. Norbert Weiner was an American philosopher and mathematician interested in the application of feedback loops in engineering, computer science, biology, neuroscience, philosophy, and society more broadly. His book, Cybernetics, or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine, was published in 1948 and it mapped out the theoretical terrain for autonomous servo mechanisms that are used in navigation, computing, communication and artificial intelligence, as well as many other applications. The word cybernetics has its origin in the Greek term kybernetic, which translates to governance, and kybernau, meaning to steer or navigate, and kybernetes, which means the governor or the helmsperson of a ship. One of the fundamental principles of cybernetics is the feedback loop. An excellent example of this is the toilet system. When you flush the toilet, you release a valve that empties the water tank from the tank into the bowl. This causes the level with the floating ball attached to drop and then turn on the tap to refill the tank. As the water fills the tank, the ball floats to the top. When it reaches the top, it switches off the tank and the tank is ready to be emptied again. This is a cybernetic feedback loop. Through the feedback loop system, a cybernetic machine detects changes in the environment and it enacts its mechanics to make a correction and steer the system back to the point at which the environment and the machine are in equilibrium. In developing the science of cybernetics, Norbert Weiner took inspiration from innovations in radar technologies in World War II. He observed that there was a network of relations that existed between the radar operator, the screen that they were using, the external detection technology, the aircraft being detected, and the region of space in which these actors were operating. He turned this work into anti-aircraft technologies that led to the formation of the principles of cybernetics, which later influenced the development of rocketry, robotics, computation, and automation. Viner's work helped to create the first designs for self-guiding rockets, which were able to respond to their environment and be programmed to independently navigate through conditions via a series of feedback systems. Weiner's innovation was to configure a system that enabled self-correcting actions, where the machine of the rocket automatically adjusts its velocity, direction, speed, etc., to match that of its target. 
Norbert Weiner's work helped to develop the science of cybernetics into a methodology of systems and the general concept of the cybernetic perspective, which I'm going to summarize very briefly here in four points. In the cybernetic perspective, the first point is that systems have goals. And that means that systems are clearly defined by boundaries. The second point is that systems actively aim towards their goal, that is their function. But to function correctly, systems must have some kind of sensor to be able to orient itself towards that goal. The third point in the cybernetic perspective is the idea that environments disrupt systems and can cause a system to deter from its goal. This means that systems depend on information flow between the environment and their sensors to operate successfully. Finally, systems use information to respond through feedback loops to correct the detour. This means that all systems respond through feedback loops. And this applies to everything from the most basic of organisms and single-celled single animals to the most complex computers, artificial robots, and of course, the environment, as well as the human brain. You can use this cybernetic perspective in thinking about the way in which the tension between the representation of reality in the cinema that we're examining in this course and the reality of these kinds of systems that you experience in everyday life. This brings us to what's known as second order cybernetics. The cybernetic perspective was the foundation for the work of English anthropologist and cyberneticist Gregory Bateson, who helped to extend cybernetics to the social realm and the behavioral sciences. Bateson was interested in human systems and their relationship to the ecosystem and the concept of ecological balance and the role of both positive and negative feedback systems. Positive feedback systems are where information accumulates and that helps the system reach equilibrium. A negative feedback system is where information registers as a, as a loss of something and the system works to increase that. You can think of the thermostat as both involving a positive and negative feedback system. Once the temperature is set, if the temperature increases above that temperature, the air, the air conditioning system will come into effect in order to reduce the temperature. If the temperature gets too cold and is providing a negative feedback, the system will increase the heat in the available space to bring the temperature back into equilibrium. Bateson framed the role of information in a network as a form of constraint. A system is dependent on the information available to it, and so control over information is hugely important for the command over and the control of any system. And this applies to everything from societies to microchips. In cybernetics, every deviation from a goal generates information for the system, which then acts to counter the deviation and bring the system back into balance. But second order cybernetics includes the observer in the system. Bateson argued that we never see how a system works by standing outside of it, because that is impossible. When we observe a system in action, we are actually engaged with it cybernetically, because we introduce information into the environment of that system, and that system introduces information into our environment, and that gets incorporated in our own system. These systems are introducing information into the environment of each other. The system we observe is introducing information into the environment of our own personal system. And therefore, these two systems are communicating cybernetically via different sensorial mechanisms. Now, these ideas have been picked up by different sciences, industries, philosophies, and of course, academic disciplines. In science, cybernetics is the systematic observation of systems. In psychology, cybernetics is the science of communication and found in the theory of constructivism as the way in which society constructs the reality of human knowledge. In contrast, the opposite is understood in postmodern critical theory, which holds that it is the receiver in, of information that forms meaning in the cybernetic system of society. Cybernetics is a cornerstone of modern computational and communication technologies. 
the science of self-steering machines has been applied to engineering, mathematics, healthcare, ecology, farming, sociology, architecture, management, and even law. And it is a vital component for thinking about the future, your own personal future, the future of humanity, the future of the media and communication industries, and beyond. Perhaps most importantly, cybernetics has been applied to the building of machines that assist humans and work to expand the capacities of the human body and the human mind in different ways. Historically, this has been important in agriculture, where cybernetic machines are used to increase crop gains. Cybernetics and the building of cybernetic machines has been vitally important in communication, in everything from the telegraph to the internet. Cybernetics is a major component of the technologies that are used in the course of fighting wars, in everything from the catapult and the trebuchet to modern instruments of war. One of the most cybernetic inventions which arguably shaped the direction of cyberculture and the development of the information society and the network society in the 20th and 21st centuries, however, was never actually physically produced. Called the Memex, a portmanteau of memory and index, this machine was proposed by American inventor and wartime science administrator Vannevar Bush in an article published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1945. At the time of publication, the Atlantic Monthly was a literary and commentary magazine interested in politics, technology, and international relations, and Bush's article was published just after Germany had surrendered at the close of World War II, but while the war was still ongoing with Japan, and therefore around the same time as the first use of atomic weapons, which Bush had an association with. So this article and this invention comes at a time when people are tremendously sick of war and the technologies of destruction. And we're looking forward to a time of peace and prosperity and turning the, the technological improvements that had been developed through military technology towards benefiting the lives of everyone in everyday life. And so Bush imagined a way of using technology to manage information more effectively a machine that would respond to information and help to augment and expand the way humans think and learn and communicate that knowledge. Drawing on the technologies of his time, such as microphotography, facsimile transmission, algorithmic computation and, pro and basic processing, Bush proposed the mimics as a means for overcoming the physical limitations of books, human memory and linear records. Using a series of televisual screens and microfilm libraries of information, Vannevar Bush predicted that the Memex would create wholly new forms of encyclopedias with ready-made meshes of associative trails running through them, ready to be dropped into the Memex and then amplified. So Bush imagined a cybernetic machine that would mimic the operations of the human brain in the assembly of knowledge and increase the potential of the human brain to form new knowledge. He imagined that this machine would allow the operator to make connections and form associative trail between different pieces of information that are usually disconnected by the physical collections of information in places like archives and libraries. He imagined individual researchers being able to exchange collections of recorded trials in order to be able to swap knowledge and produce new insights. It's important to remember that the, the human brain doesn't work in strictly logical or hierarchical ways because it has evolved to operate by association and pattern recognition. Brains can remember via smell or sound or pressure change or music and song or even events, but can struggle to recall complex numbers and computation quickly. The human brain doesn't work like an encyclopedia, processing information through alphabetical order in order to recall it. And Bush was trying to invent something that would mimic the capacity of the human brain with the technologies available at the time, creating new ontologies. 
an ontology in this instance, meaning a system of categorization and organization that would be formed by links between information, connections between discrete elements of knowledge in order to support innovation and the creation of new knowledge. Bush imagined what it would be like if you could have all information available at your fingertips. I know that seems commonplace and very mundane today, but in the 1940s, this was a, a, a radically imaginative idea. Bush thought that with the Memex, you could control the navigation of your data via a mechanical interface and using different screens, build trails between different bits of information and then save those trails to share with others. For Bush, the actual technologies involved in the Memex were secondary to the idea of a cybernetic machine that could expand the potential of the human brain and create even new ways of enabling us to think differently. Just as writing, the printing press, and the typewriter helped to develop the human brain's ability to communicate with text, and the telescope broadens the potential of the human eye to see things far away, and the, mic the microscope enables us to see tiny things up close, or the phonograph re you know, with, the, with the microphone that records the voice. And then, of course, the radio and the television allowed us to expand the reach of our vocal cords around the world. Bush wanted to create a machine that would develop the human brain's ability to create new knowledge by more easily making connections between previously separate pieces of information and communicate those connections and associations to others. His ideas are famous for influencing computer engineer Douglas Engelbart, who were vitally important pioneers of a worldwide computer network known as the ARPANET that laid the foundations for the internet. Bush also inspired Ted Nelson's work on the concept of hypertext, which is the underlying principle of the World Wide Web. Although it was Engelbart and others that would help to make it a reality, hypertext was imagined by Nelson, who was an American philosopher of technology working since the, the mid-1960s. Nelson's pioneering work, Project Xanadu, in 1960, sought to create a computer network with a simple user interface that would enable parallel links between documents and sources of information. These links mirror Vannevar Bush's idea of connected trails and are a foundational component of cyberculture as both a feedback system and an informational layer of the networked age. Nelson used the English prefix hyper, which comes from the Greek meaning over or beyond, because it shares an origin with the Latin prefix for super, which suggests overcoming the constraints of linear textual experiences. Nelson imagined that all text and all media could be connected by two-way links. Quote, by now the word hypertext has become generally accepted for branching and responding text. But the corresponding word, hypermedia, means complexes of branching and responding graphics, movies, and sound, end quote. Nelson saw linear texts like archives, documents, movies, and stories, and so on, like a prison. His vision was a system to support the radically different ways that texts and media could be created and remixed by the human brain, no longer limited by the traditional tools and linear construction methods of writing and editing. And so I was very open to new ways of doing this. I didn't like the restrictions of paper. As I would abstract it now, the two concepts were we can have parallel connections between visible documents. So you can, have, you can have two pages with a connection saying this sentence is connected to that paragraph and see it as a visible strap or bridge. And, and, uh, and uh, you can't do that yet. So that was one of my hypertext concepts. And the other hypertext concept was, was being able to click on something and jump to it. So uh, as the hypertext concept developed and deteriorated over the years, the, uh, only the jump link became popular in the hypertext systems of the 60s and 70s. 
Nelson's hypertext predates the World Wide Web, which was proposed by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989 and created using the hypertext markup language, HTML, which is actually a much simplified version of hypertext that Nelson views as woefully incomplete. He admits, yes, that um, Berners-Lee's HTML implementation to create the World Wide Web is elegant and effective, but it realizes only half the potential of what could be possible with a truly two-way hypertextual linking information network system. The point for Nelson is that a system of two-way links, so whatever you're linking to, links back instantaneously whenever you create that link. It's not just a one-way path. A system of two-way links would have preserved the context of the link and therefore the inherent relationship between the two parts of the link are connected, unlike the one-way movement provided by the current web. Nelson's approach was more like Anavar Bush and his idea of the memex because he proposed the idea that users would be able to create new knowledge and explore new types of creativity by assembling new works from pre-existing texts and elements of sound, media, performance and so on. He imagined essentially a system for remixing information that would bring together personal connections to create unique documents that could be shared between multiple users and connected sources. In Nelson's model, the link between the source and the new document retains the connection to the original. So nothing is obscured in this cybernetic system. No information is lost, which further enables the user to assemble new ideas, observations, and analyze patterns that this system enables even be able to then reimburse those whose assemblages and whose trails you use in order to create new knowledge and information. Nelson's interconnected system is the basis for what philosopher Michel Foucault describes as a heterotopia, a space that is simultaneously physical and mental, a cyberspace. And so that's where I want to end the lecture for this week. The cybernetic perspective is especially valuable for thinking about the future and thinking about your own personal future, the future of technologies and the future of systems because it contemplates the types of information we have, the types of feedback loops that, that the systems that that information is a part of are accessing and using and can be applied to biological, mechanical, sociological, psychological processing of information that can actually lead to creating creating new ideas about the future. And remember, the future is now. <laughs>